Has either of you watched the last season of Picard? No, I've watched none of it. You don't really belong on this show, I'm getting. I Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the slightly scatterbrained astronomy podcast where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the hosts have nothing in common. Nope. Aw. Aw. We are Strange Top and Down, the Astro Quarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Jim Cooney, and Audrey Martin, coming to you from the Walkabout Studio at the University of Central Florida. Today we are recording a Charmless episode, mm. because Charm Quark Addy Dove is too cool for school. Mm. Yep. Remember to subscribe to us on all platforms, including mm -hmm. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but not Jim, mm -hmm. Brainly, Meet Space, or dandy time. Dandy time is spelled D A N D time. Dan D time. Dan D A N D. So it's a social network for people whose name is Dan. No, sorry. D and D. Oh. Dandy. Dan E D time. Dan D. I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it. that's got to be real. Which one is real? This is the question one. for you. Only one is real? Yeah. Brainly, meat space, or dandy. Dandy. Time. Is the meat space M E E T or M E A T? A T. M E A T. M E A T. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be One of those that's, is real. It's that's be porn. Dandy. D and D time? Yeah. Uh, meat space is real. I fooled you both. No! Oh no! Brainly, oh. brainly is real, and I made up meat space and D and D. So time. you made up a social media platform and <laughs> tricked us by pretending you didn't know it how to pronounce us. it. That's, and oh, what's oh, this I know, thing? I don't psychology. know. I've never seen it before. <laughs> yeah. oh, man. I just know how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. D and D time. Well, it could, it could have been I some kind of go, social think, network for Dungeons they, and Dragons players. Exactly. Yeah. I think they do call it Dan D time. The non-existent <laughs> imagined yes. users oh, of the okay. D and D time right. social I've network. Had. <laughs> I had you both. Yep. But brainly is real. What is, is it? it? Like just I for brains? Know. It maybe maybe it's like Mensa or something. Brainly. <laughs> yeah. Brainly. You can contact us anytime at WTG at UCF.edu with questions, compliments, and to find out how to get a cool walkabout t-shirt like Down Cork Audrey Martin is wearing right now. Our stumper today, mm, it's not my favorite stumper, but we're going to go for it. It's interstellar travel. Ooh, Science like fiction, it. you know, has, always figuring out ways to get people from point A to point B, usually just like Magic. magic wand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a little bit of magic in your choice here because yes. suspended animation is one of your options. So think of that movie with, um, was it Jennifer Lawrence? And Chris Pratt? Yes. Yep. I, I wanted to see that, and it, I got I got shot down because it was supposed to be not good. It wasn't good. I saw a re-edited or like a, a trailer for a re-edited version where it's, it's much a, better. Where it's a thriller. <laughs> it's so much better. Oh. So. Um, the premise of that movie is there's like an interstellar colony ship and um, some people are accidentally awakened prematurely. Mm -hmm. So your question is, actually though, which would you prefer? Have a life on, you're not the only ones, but like if you're on an interstellar colony ship mm -hmm. going to an unknown planet, there's no movie theaters or Starbucks at the planet. Right. There is on the ship. Mm. Okay, with I don't know, a thousand people or something. Let's say on your ship, do you want to be alive and live your life on the ship, or do you want to be in suspended animation and live your life on the great new planetary frontier? Do the people alive on the ship ever get to see the new planet? No, the voyage is longer than a human lifetime. Ah, that makes it. Tough. That makes it a stumper. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. I think, ooh, I think I would want to be asleep and then wake up at the new planet. At the new frontier. Yeah. So your frontier, your pioneers. Yeah, I think so. Although like I that. would definitely have FOMO, like just about oh, missing really? out on all the fun all times the life. that well, were happening around me while I was in suspended animation. Okay. But imagine, I mean, your choice is like, 
if you're in suspended animation, then in the in the version of the stumper, there's going to be a thousand people also in suspended animation. Right, right. So you might miss out on some people's fun, but you're going to have your whole group of people. Right, to for sure. Settle the planet. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Okay. Yeah. Really, honestly, to die probably in the first week. But probably, <laughs> but you know, what a week. Yeah. What about you, Jim? I guess it depends on why I'm, you know, why I'm on the ship in the first place. You have to be on the ship. If I have to be on the ship because like the Earth is blowing up or something, and we're going out there, then I, I want to just live on the ship. Okay. Under what circumstances does your answer change to the other? Well, like, if, I mean, why the hell am I on the ship in the first? If I'm on the ship in the first place, just because I want to go to a new cool place, and I don't want to live on Earth anymore for some reason, I just want to move. Then I want to be in suspended animation and get to the place. Do you want to go to a new cool place? Maybe. <laughs> Florida's getting tough. It's hot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but not really. No, I mean, I'd prefer to stay on Earth. Okay. Probably. But, you right. know, I well, that, that's you. That's This is a question right. for you. It's not mm -hmm. for hypothetical non-you, you. It's for well, you. Well, no, I'm saying, but like it, 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 in, in the case where I am... Uh, a different person who wants to go to a different planet? No, that's not what the stumper is. It's you. Mm -hmm. No, I'm Jim saying, is Earth Ernie. in peril or not? Earth? Earth is it in peril? Am I, I on a colony ship because I have no choice? I, why does it matter? It's still you. Yeah. You have to be on the ship. You personally have to be on the ship. Okay, then I'm living on the ship. I'm living on the ship. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to send the ship. Yeah, it's got cool things. It's got tennis courts. It's got, uh, like yeah. said, it's got movies. Movie theaters. Yeah. Well, when the ship lands on the new planet, like the ship isn't going to blow up, I assume, so we'll have the tennis courts. Oh, that's true. That is true. You already that's said your answer, point. though, so that's, 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 that's fine. I'm on the ship. That is true. I'm on the ship. Well, <laughs> today we'll talk about rings around your rings around your quawar. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to mm -hmm. say something else. We are going to talk about something about around Uranus, yep. mm -hmm. which are yep. new ocean worlds. Mm -hmm. They're not new worlds, but our understanding of them has advanced a bit. That's correct. And tiny black holes. Aww. But first, well, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by... Moore's Law. If you're feeling stuck in a rut, get Moore's Law to give your business a boost. Taking advantage of exponential growth, Moore's Law will supercharge your affairs. Whether you're putting transistors on a chip or tribbles in a grain storage unit, get Moore's Law to double your investment and double it again. Available in the original two-year doubling time or for a modest surcharge, get even faster acceleration. It's always the more the merrier with Moore's Law. <laughs> Moore's Law cannot be held responsible for the results of overflowing finite capacities. Moore's Law. Timing is everything. Rolex. Reasonable, but do you know what Moore's Law is? It does not sound familiar. I, I am not familiar with it either. Are you kidding me? Yes, yeah. it's a joke. <laughs> <Not you. laughs> you don't know what Moore's Law is? Uh, not by name. No. That is the, it's not a real law, it's the observation made oh, by Gordon Moore yeah, yeah, that in like, around 1970 that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every two years. Mm. I have heard that, yeah. but I, did, I, Isn't I, it I couldn't up put a name on it. Like soon it's going to not actually... We're getting, you get it's at like, certain it's, point... It's getting to the point where it's like... At a certain like, point you uh, can't actually do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, Past quantum computing. Yeah. So, oh, okay, wow. Rolex. I thought, um, I guess I'm nerdier than you guys. How does that make you feel? You're older than us. It makes me feel <laughs> You said those from 1970-something. <laughs> well, I didn't know about it in 1970. <laughs> um, so it's not Rolex. Oh, is it like, is it um, has to like do. birth control? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like that Timing one too, is everything. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. Texas Instruments. I was going for like a chip oh. maker. Oh, yeah. gotcha. Um, mm. So yeah, Moore's Law was this empirical observation. Gordon Moore, who was the CEO, I think, of Texas Instruments at oh. one point in time, who noticed that the number of transistors that were fitting on an integrated circuit chip was increasing exponentially and doubling roughly initially every year. In 1970 he modified it to every two years. We're going to come back to this mm. in our trivia. Ooh. Oh, that's why you wanted us to Ooh, know about it. I can relate it. that to a bonus trivia. I didn't trivia. want you to know about it. I assumed you knew about it. <laughs> it's like if I say you know something about gravity, I don't want you to know about it. I just take it for granted that you know about if it. I I didn't, it. If I didn't know about it, would you would you want me to know about it? I would educate you about it, Thank as you. I have educated you, you about Moore's Law. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. 
Um, has either of you watched the last season of Picard? No, I have watched none of it. You don't really belong on this show, I'm getting. This I show. want <laughs> to watch it. There's okay. other things that um, I have to do and stuff. I you? saw something about it that leads me to ask you a trivia question. Oh. Oh. Uh, I'm a this big is a, a peremptory trivia. Quick, 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 I'm impromptu a fan of trivia. Picard, okay, the you're character, a fan of Picard. All right. and you can stay on the show. Patrick Stewart, the actor. Oh, you can stay so on good. the show, Audrey. It's okay. Um, I even have a nickname for him. I call him Peace Stew. I follow sorry? him on Instagram. <laughs> Peace Stew. I follow him on Instagram. Oh, he Peace Stew. Right. Yeah, he has a lot of. He uh, has an Instagram? He does. And He's much he, older than we are. Uh, he has um, a lot of foster dogs. Yes. And mm -hmm. they're usually pit bulls, and he calls yes. them his pibbles, and it's really cute. <laughs> yeah. He's a good guy. Mm hmm. Uh, I was watching the other day The Cage. Yes. The, the original... The original pilot. Pilot for Star Trek. Uh, the original series. Uh, and in whom Majel Barrett stars as... Or number one. co-stars as number one. Yes. Uh, so, Josh, I think you're going to know the answer to this. This is just for our listeners. Okay. Uh, in the Majel Barrett's lifetime... You're saying major or Majel? Majel, Majel M A J E L. Was, uh, Majel she was Barrett. the she, she was the wife Nurse Chapel. Of she was married to Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry. And she mm. also provided the voice for all the computers, like the ship computer voice. Oh, You're ruining also, the question. Oh, <laughs> who did the? <laughs> no, that wasn't it. it but was it was going to be this. There have been in her lifetime. There was I'm I'm I'm, I'm grouping here nine incantations of Star Trek. Okay. Here I'm grouping together the original series movies, the Next Generation movies, and the next, the reboot movies. Okay. As three three things, and then six series. Mm -hmm. Can we name them? Uh, original series. Original next series. Gen. Next Generation. Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Enterprise. Enterprise. Discovery. That was like after. Like after what? Like after oh, Major Barrett. Oh, in Major Barrett. Major Barrett. Yeah. Animated series. The animated series. Yeah. Isn't it like a Voyage, Voyager, Voyages or something? I said, didn't I say Voyager? I don't think you said Voyager. Voyager. So that's okay, yeah. <laughs> Got one. So my Good question, my question was... <laughs> my daughter's going to be really mad at me for skipping Voyager. <laughs> in how many of those did Major Barrett okay. uh, <laughs> all of them. show up? Was it all of them? And how many of those nine incantations of Star Trek did she play a part? Okay. All right. Sorry for getting carried away there. The answer is all of them. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I, that I brought that up, by the way, is she also, she was not the computer in most of Picard, but she did show up as the computer in Picard episode three, or episode or season, season three. three in one of the episodes. Yeah. I mean, posthumously, of course. Right. She, she died right. in 2008, I believe. Yeah. Also, she played Deanna Troy's mom in right. Next Walks Gen. Right, on a Troy. Oh, okay. Yes. I watched Next Gen. Yeah. Well, you've seen Major Barrett then. There you go. Sure have. What kind of show is this again? <laughs> Astronomy. Um, okay, it's so Star Trek. our first yeah. <laughs> our first topic is about the rings around Quawar. So yeah. the this we have mentioned before, but there have been new observations. So Quawar is an awkwardly named um, dwarf planet. <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out whether it's a cent. I can't remember if it's a centaur. I believe it's a centaur. Oh, which I, I is, thought it was a, a Kuiper Belt object. I don't. Oh, maybe it is. Um, but it's way out there. Okay, then it's a Kuiper Belt. Yes, object. it's a Kuiper Belt okay, okay, object. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. So that's an object beyond the orbit of Neptune, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, a dwarf planet, which means it's big enough to be round. Ish. It's it, the force of gravity has deformed it into a spheroidal shape, right. um, and uh, but it's not so large that it is gravitationally dominating its realm of the solar system. Right. Hence the the dwarf terminology, um, and it has rings. So there's been a few of these distant, smallish objects. That right off the bat blows my world. It still up. Mm -hmm. is very surprising. I, I, I I'm flabbergasted that something that small I mean we've seen things even smaller than that with rings but well that, that's crazy. not not, mm -hmm. not much smaller because I mean you know they're in these small what I would call small bodies mm -hmm. like not planets mm -hmm. um, the rings that we're most familiar with are around the giant planets Jupiter Saturn Uranus and Neptune 
and Jim and I at least are old enough that we sort of in our early days thought of rings as like the leftover stuff from when you made a giant planet and when you're making a giant planet it's like its own mini solar system where they have so many moons right. mm. you have all this mat- you have a disk around right. Right. The those moons are all forming. in the same plane and they're all orbiting the same direction yeah as in the same plane as the same way the solar right system there. formed and so yeah. you're going to end up with some leftover stuff in this disk because there's a lot of material there and if that stuff is too close to the planet within this distance we call the Roche limit, then the tidal force from the planet is literally too strong to allow those particles to stick together and make a moon. So that's a very nice story. Right, Beyond the Roche good. limit, you have those particles accrete and they form a moon, and then you get these, you know, and all these giant planets have a bunch of moons, and then closer in, they don't stick together, and you have a bunch of rings, and all of them have a bunch of rings. Mm-hmm. So that's great. How does that work around Quawar? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it does because they don't form that way. No. The Quawar didn't have an accretion disk. It didn't have, right. wasn't sucking in all sorts of material and have this nice disk around it where you can make a ring. So it has to make that ring some other way. And the right. same with the other small bodies that yeah. have those rings. That's right. Yeah. Regardless so, of the Roche limit. That's right. Okay. Forget about even the Roche limit, yeah. which is, you know, so just getting to Jim's point, it's like just them having rings at all is weird. Right, right. Then you get to what you just mentioned. The Roche limit. Yeah. So how could you make a ring without that accretion disk? Well, one way is you you have a little moonlit around it. So you can imagine that these small objects may be formed in pairs. And so then something hits one of those two things and shatters it. And then you have a bunch of debris around the other one. That's fine. Okay. Mm-hmm. But then if you're outside the Roche limit, that stuff should, should eventually shouldn't like hang out. It should go away or get together. Right. But it shouldn't hang out in a nice ring. How fast does it have fast. to go away? Like Di- yeah, like, on a sh- like ten years or like ten thousand years or um so five minutes. <laughs> the dynamic so that's a good question. Thank you. That's my me stalling for time. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely not. It's, a, it's not minutes or hours. It's, it's not minutes it's or hours, and it's not billions of years. Right. Um, it's, it's and more. and what are the processes to move those things around? So like the individual particles <laughs> get pushed around sure. by collisions with each other and by um, gravitational interactions and by solar pressure if they're small particles, mm-hmm. um, and the collisional spreading time scale depends on how long it takes them to orbit that central thing Mm. and that's going to be sort of like a daisy type days d-a-y-s hyphen y i was imagining like a daisy um orbit where it kind of goes in and out and in and out so they're colliding and that causes things to spread out so rings should spread out over time Mm. and you end up with just sort of random debris that ends up hitting the central object or flying off into space so those things haven't happened around Quawar. And it has two rings that are well outside this Roche limit. So do you want to you tell could us buy what the Roche wall. limit is? Well, it's just, it's that. I think I sort of you said just it. Did. Yeah. yeah. Inside of that, things like to spread out. Outside of that, things like to conglomerate, Yeah. basically. Or th- I say spread out, I just mean sit there as a ring. Hang out as a ring. But... So these two rings, first of all, I have questions about these rings. I, I'm blown away, but are these two rings in the same plane? Whoa, that would be insane if they aren't. I, I, I believe what? that they are approximately coplanar. Coplanar. Are there rings that aren't coplanar? Barely. So there are some ring. Some rings have some inclination, but pretty minimal. So the rings of Uranus... Ha, there are some of them that have some little inclinations. Like a degree or two? or Like a degree or a fraction of a okay. degree. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, I could believe, if there was just one ring, you you could sell me the story that, like, there had been a very recent mm-hmm. collision or something like that, and that the debris just hadn't had time to spread but out yet. Two. Yeah. But two of them? I'm, 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 too, I'm, too you, much I'm not I'm not buying that. Because I think, I mean, for Kuiper Belt objects, I think I've, I've read enough, like, dynamics papers that say that 
binaries are pretty common. So finding a binary within the Kuiper Belt population is, it, it, you know, it can't be that strange. And there's a lot of these like, you know, binary objects that are kind of conjoined. So even things that we see as singular could be binaries as well. So the material isn't, it's not surprising that the material yeah. is there. It's just surprising that it's hanging out in yeah. a ring yeah. form. Yeah, so I, they don't have tight constraints on the orbits. So they're assuming, their modeling is basically assuming that it's coplanar. If it were wildly different, I think that would show up in the data. So how do they see these things from stellar occultations? So by seeing the right. blip mm -hmm. of star as it passes behind the object and it passes behind a ring, the star dims and comes back. That just gives you like one point in that ring's orbit. Right. So then how do you know it's a ring instead of a moon? Well, you see it multiple times with multiple stars or from multiple telescopes, which are seeing a different point right. along that um, path. Right. And so everything seems to point to both of these things being continuous uh, circular rings all the way around uh, the object, hmm. around Quawar. So they've got this now two rings, Q1R, and Q2R, they're both outside the Roche limit. Um, and uh, I think we had mentioned before that for them to be sort of inside the Roche limit, they'd have to be made of like cotton candy density type <laughs> uh, stuff. So, so you spent half a lifetime studying rings of Saturn, more particularly, but tell me. I'm, I'm How'd they get there? What's going on? Yeah, I share your astonishment, uh, quite frankly. So. In my, in my youth, I modeled the formation of rings by the breakup of small objects. Mm -hmm. uh, catastrophic impact, asteroid, comet comes in, smacks into a moon, make the rings of Uranus. Mm -hmm. um, so that is my supposition for what's going on here. That implies this thing had two moons in a coplanar orbital system around Quawar. Okay, that's already that's a little bit stretching funky, it a little bit, yeah. Right? Um, then you can find these rings, they're outside the Roche limit, requires some other... Like uh, a shepherding moon type yeah. of situation. So there, are, there is a moon, there is another object around Quawar called Waywat. Waywat. Hmm. Um, and there can be resonances or perturbations from Waywat. There's also apparently a resonance between Q1R and the rotation of Quawar itself. Mm -hmm. And these resonances basically are like a periodic gravitational kick of the ring particles. And so as they're like trying to spread out due to their collisions with each other, mm -hmm. if they're getting the right kind of periodic forcing from something else like a moon or the non-symmetric gravitational field of the central object, oh. that periodic kicking can push back against that natural tendency for it to spread. So probably something like that is going on. Why they're not sticking together or glomming together more and maintaining their existence as a nice continuous ring, uh, I'd, I'd have to quit my day job, go back, <laughs> to, go back to my old day job to try to figure that one out. But yeah. it's pretty cool. Um, Weird. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. so strange. I just, I don't know, I just was like, oh yeah, there's rings around, like, Trinclo. <laughs> yeah, Chiriclo. Yeah, yeah, and, well, you know, why not? I don't know. Why not? Yeah. But that does, that's super, super strange. Yeah, that's super strange. I imagine over time we're going to get, we're never going to get a picture of these, right? Because it's Quar is so never far say away. Never but right. we're never not in our not in our life. Yeah. <laughs> but we will. That that we should get we should get better data about that. Yeah. I, I was actually impressed looking at this paper. I, mean, I didn't read it in any great detail, but they they can even kind of tell the width of you know by how much the stars dim. It's right. like the width and like there's like a central part that denser yeah. in the outer. I mean, they can tell a lot about the structure of these rings. I imagine obviously over time, the more so more these, we look at these, the better we'll. So just understand. to throw some numbers on there before we move on, um, these rings are like uh, four or more um, Quawar radii away from Quawar, and the Roche limit is like two. So they're well beyond the Roche limit. Wow. The rings themselves are like a few kilometers to 10 or 20, with one at some locations being as much as maybe 60 kilometers 
uh, wide with some structure that they've been able to see. So these are like some of the rings that we see around Saturn, like the F ring of Saturn, mm -hmm. and Uranus, mm -hmm. the object of our next yes. discussion. Yes, yes. Well, Uranus's um, moons. How many? In huh. total, 27. Oh! But we're going to talk about the largest four um, that may have um, briny oceans deep beneath their crusts. We're we're very what? comfortable. Yeah, we're very comfortable with the idea liquid of liquid like, water. You mean? That's right. We're very comfortable what? with like, you know, Enceladus and Europa. The idea that there's an ocean on them, but yeah, we might have an ocean even further out in the solar system where it's a lot, lot colder. Mm -hmm. It's a it's just, yeah. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it might as well just be infinitely cold. I mean, it's not like yeah, absolute, exactly. It's yeah. not absolute zero, but it's so far from the melting point of water that it kind of might as well be exactly. If you're that yeah. cold, it's like turn it down another few Kelvin. What difference does it make? Mm -hmm. right? But for Enceladus, you said, oh, we're planet, comfortable yeah. with Enceladus, mm -hmm. but I'm like, we would not. I mean, I think we did get other data that shows there's water underneath the surface of Enceladus, but the reason we really suspected is like, oh, there's geysers blasting right. out of Enceladus. I'm not you comfortable, like, by the way, you know, with Enceladus. I, okay, right. I think it's before hard. that discovery of those, those geysers, I think nobody would have thought Enceladus liquid is liquid. You know, okay, is. So enough. we have like proof, there it is. You can see the steam coming mm -hmm. out of Enceladus. And even knowing that, people had to like really go to all sorts of mathematical contortions to come up with a way to explain how it could be warm enough for there to be liquid water yeah. on Enceladus. So what the hell's going on so, on yeah. Uranus? How did they manage yeah. around, around Uranus? Uranus? Yeah, so for Europa and Enceladus, well, at least Europa, tidal heating is tidal heating. Is the big, I'm good with. Yeah, is the yeah. big reason. You know, there's it, the the moon itself is stretching as it goes around um, its planet, but. Apparently, that's not what's going on. So the heating, that the heating mechanism for the Uranian satellites isn't tidal. Um, what they think is that it's the uh, decay of um, of aluminum from when these moons first radioactive decay. Radioactive decay. Radioactive um, decay. From when these these moons first came together is still the heating mechanism that is keeping the water water and not ice so this is this challenges my preconceived notions of how much radioactive stuff there just was in the solar system yeah yeah totally and it they so they did a lot of modeling and a lot of the data in this new study came from um voyager 2 oh. um the images That's so long surface, ago right yeah so uh, images of the surface plus new um, spectral data. So mm -hmm. people have started getting excited about the Uranian satellites and um, they've been looking at some spectra and what they've found is that there could be evidence of ammonia or ammonium on the surface. Oh, antifreeze. Exactly. Mm. So uh. these liquids likely have a lot of antifreeze in them. Oh. And so they can be super, super, super cold and still liquid. Ah, uh, okay. Pretty cool. Okay. And and then this is, but this is a, this is a prediction, not an observation. Um, I mean, the, 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 the ammonia being there is an observation. Correct. But the existence of liquid briny oceans is yes. a yeah. prediction. Correct. So a combination of the kind of surface geomorphology of the ice and the existence of these um, of the ammonia or ammonium on the surface together plus a lot of modeling that I do not <laughs> understand um, leads, leads the scientists to believe that yeah there could totally be oceans beneath the surface and when they go into talking about different like the salts if it's just salt um, it doesn't have to be as salty as even um, like the Great Salt Lake in Utah huh. so and there's not, life and not stuff like, not crazy crazy salt right yeah and there's life and stuff around 
in the Great Salt, Salt Lake. Lake. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there are no fish in there, but there are. There's lifey things. There's lots of life. Yeah. There's bacterial kind of yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So okay. the I mean you know just to take it a step further like the conditions aren't like you know they're not awesome. super 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 terrible. All right, I got a question for you guys about yeah. this. I know we're we're dragging on a little bit here, but. Uh, you guys <laughs> crushed my hopes and dreams a couple weeks ago. Oh, you're welcome. For life on Mars. For life on Mars. Uh, so my question is this. Huh. You crushed my dreams because you said that the water on Mars didn't last well, very long. Or it was what we intermittent. That episode. Yeah. We yeah. say a different thing about water on Mars every episode. So, 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 so <laughs> Europa, Enceladus, uh, Miranda. Uh, not Miranda. Miranda's the only one. Oh. Uh, Umbriel, Ariel, Ariel, Titania, Titania and, and Oberon. Oberon. Oberon, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Greek how long? Uh, Shakespearean. Shakespearean. Moves. How long Umbriel's does the water yeah. last on those things? That is, is this a, is this a better place to look for life than Mars? This is primordial. Yeah. yeah because the, yeah. this. Yes. So, so this is age happens, of the solar system water. Mm-hmm. Yes, as mm-hmm. you know, it takes a lot of heat to do a phase change. So yeah. it's harder, it's easier to keep something molten than it is to melt. Right, right. So you have to have it start molten, and then you can keep it molten if you've got your antifreeze going and mm-hmm. your aluminum radioactive right. decay and that, that sort of heating. Right. I guess you if I thought about the, the heat source, I mean, that's a source. That, I mean, radioactive stuff is there from the beginning and will slowly decline. Yeah. decline. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so if that is the heat source, then that would make sense that mm-hmm. it's been around. The original, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they're saying that the residual oceans, because they are freezing out gradually, mm-hmm. right? The residual oceans <gasps> the have, an, there. have yeah. an upper limit thickness for aerial and umbrial of 30 kilometers and 50 kilometers for Titania and Oberon. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that's so tiny compared to those moons. But on mm-hmm. the Earth, it's like, what? One kilometer. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Averaged over yeah. the ocean, averaged over the whole <laughs> surface of the planet. Yeah, there might be more mm-hmm. water in those places there than there is on yeah. Earth. We think yeah. about yeah. Earth as like, oh, we're the water world, but it's actually it's very thin not layer. much water, mm-hmm. at least on the outer part of the planet mm. by bulk. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, oh. because. Well, you have renewed my uh, enthusiasm. My enthusiasm we've, for life. Thank you. So we Thank crushed you, your hopes and now we've brought them back. <laughs> yeah, to that's life. right. That's right. Um, so, and we're, you know, at some point in the hopefully not too distant future, there'll be a new mission to Uranus. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and an that. Orbiter. Yeah, and that was a really cool thing that the study went into was what are. The measurements. The measurements that are going to be needed to detect these different types of, right. of ocean oceans. Um, and depending on if it's super salty or there's ammonia or whatever, there's like different things that they can test and yeah it's yeah. It, it's super super there cool. are ways they can test you like can also see if the yeah. if the outer part of the moon is decoupled exactly. from the inner yeah, part yeah. so it's sort of a shell that's floating mm-hmm. yeah well our trivia before we get to our black hole story has to do with moore's law which as i mentioned describes the doubling of the number of transistors on integrated circuits mm-hmm. approximately every two years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, transistors replaced what vacuum tubes vacuum tubes so I won! I won! <laughs> yes. <laughs> <The> last, <laughs> Let's go. The, the first general purpose electronic computer, ENIAC, which is an acronym, uh, used vacuum tubes instead of transistors, which mm-hmm. had not yet been invented at mm-hmm. that time. By the end of its operation, ENIAC is one of these giant contraptions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How many vacuum tubes did ENIAC have? Mm-hmm. So you think of the vacuum tube like a transistor, and a transistor is like a bit, right? So you can think of it that way to sort of give your way a, a way to wrap your mind around that question. How many vacuum tubes? Be sort of like if you thought it was a a 500 megabyte ENIAC was a 500 megabyte computer, then you would say there's 500 million bytes times 500 million times eight. So that number of vacuum tubes. It, so that's a way to approach that question. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the second part's going to be, uh, when was the first integrated circuit created? Mm. There's, there's two types. There's something called a hybrid integrated circuit, but the ones that we're using are called monolithic, mm. which was created a year or two after the hybrid. Mm-hmm. So we'll come back to that after we hear about black holes. Uh, black holes, here's the title of a popular science article about black holes 
tiny primordial black holes could have created their own Big Bang. Dun, dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. And uh, so this was a, a, an article, by the way, suggested uh, to us from one of our uh, longtime listeners. Okay. And it sounds oh, really? very sexy. It sounds like there's going to be... We have gross. different definitions of sexy. Yeah, maybe yeah. sexy isn't the word here. <laughs> it sounds very uh, in-your-face uh, awesome. Uh-huh. Uh, kind of, but it's it's really uh, a little bit more prosaic than that. It's it's very interesting. Okay, uh, Tell to us a cosmologist. More. <laughs> um, usually, when we're talking about black holes, we're talking about uh, the deaths of big stars, stellar mass black holes they die, mm-hmm. or supermassive black holes, the big giants that lurk in the hearts of centers of galaxies. But there is a potential third kind of black hole out there: primordial black holes. Um, so right after inflation, in the very first few gazillionths of a second of the universe, uh, things are a bit crazy, and it's very conceivable that you would form a whole bunch of black holes over a whole huge range of sizes. So obviously, we're not collapsing stars. There are no stars yet here in the first okay. fractions of a second right. of the universe. There's not even matter, really. Well, there's matter, but it's... There's uh, not uh, atoms. There's are not there atoms. Pro- are there protons? And are there quarks? Well, it depends on when you're talking about okay. it. So, so, so in the era... Between the end of inflation and nucleosynthesis, you have the formation of things like protons and neutrons. Okay. Uh, and in that era, somewhere, uh, you can easily get you know if 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 you get one region of space that just happens to be a little denser than the surround. I mean, there's it's already really dense everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if one region is a little denser than the other surrounding regions, it might get dense enough to just collapse into a black hole. Because all, all you really need for a black hole is. It's- Crazy density. A very, very high density. You don't, and you don't need a ton of mass. You just need whatever mass you have to be shoved into a really tiny uh, how, region. How long is inflation? How long does that last? Inflation lasts 10 to the minus 35th of a second-ish. <laughs> oh, so you call it an era, but it's like... <laughs> it's like uh, yeah, our eras okay. get much shorter yeah, yeah, as... Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, it's funny. In cosmology, you're usually interested in billion things, <laughs> billions of years. Yeah. Right. Or, or 10 to the minus 35, 35 seconds. seconds. Yeah. Um, so this is very early. And... and, and Nucleosynthesis, which is when you make the first helium uh, and, and lithium kind of things, that happens at about two or three minutes after the Big Bang. So you're talking about that this region in between. Oh, okay. First okay. couple of minutes. Of first the couple universe. of minutes of the universe. Almost almost any density and it's, so it's perturbation like, can it's cause like this crazy, chaotic yeah. sea of mass energy right and in that it's like people trying to get into a taylor swift concert <laughs> in, in all of that you might end up with so many people on top of each other <laughs> really <laughs> absolutely did you go see her in con- i know because you can't get a ticket to that are you kidding me you so i know anyway. some people you do and those people if they get you know they're in all anyway. their mad jostling mm-hmm. yeah the sometimes the you get tight knots gets, of people get so intense or the density gets so high that boop, there's boop. a little black hole there's a little black hole a mini black hole mini black hole actually these oh, sometimes yeah. they're okay. mini sometimes they're not so many right so there's uh, the nice thing about these primordial black holes potentially we don't know that they exist but if they do they probably exist over a huge range of different masses so from the tiniest masses like 10 to the minus 20 kilograms all the way up to big solar mass kind of black hole. So th- th- that whole realm of possibilities. Uh, and it's interesting because if you, I mean, it's possible that those black holes, by the way, there's still some people who think maybe those primordial black holes are dark matter, right? So maybe if you have a whole bunch what? of those that are the right size, you made a whole bunch of those things, can't well, see them. I thought, but that, I, there I are thought still people. tiny black holes Yeah. Are, I thought they evaporated quickly. Right, they do. So they if you make a bunch of black holes, the various dark tiny energy. <laughs> 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 well, not exactly, but um, but that is the, so that good. is what's playing the role in this. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's that's how I feel about dark energy. But that is but what this this article is about. Is about uh, you know if it depends on what the masses of these little black holes are. You're right that there's. Uh, Stephen Hawking predicted back in the 1970s that black holes will eventually evaporate. This thing, Hawking radiation, it's called, right? That uh, they'll shoot off little tiny particles, and that causes them to lose mass, which right. causes them but to slowly decay the away. The black holes we usually talk about that takes forever. Right, th- forever. right. This it's inversely, you know, how long that takes is uh, related to how big they are. And for big black holes, that happens very, very, very slowly, like 
for a solar mass black hole, it would take something like 10 to the 69 years or something like that. Like That's a lot of years. Way, 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 way longer than the age of the universe, of course. Uh, but for tiny black holes, this can happen very, very quickly. And so uh, if these black holes are all pretty small, they call them primordial. That just means old, not small. But if they're all, all really small, then who cares? They really didn't play much of a role. They all just disappear almost Im immediately. Right. Okay. Uh, if they're too big, then they never go away at all. And they're certainly not a whole bunch of them that were really big, because if there were, we'd know about them. We look for those things. Like How in, would we know about yeah. them? Well, because of things like gravitational lensing, the kind of things we were talking about. Like, so so oh. if, if one of those passes in between you and a distant background object, you're going to see a distortion of the light from that distant back, okay. background object. And so by looking at the whole sky, doing these big sky surveys, you can kind of get a limit, a limit on, on how, how many, many, how big, many ones. big ones there are. Uh, but it could be that there are a bunch of little ones because they will lens stuff so so infrequently um, and so minimally that you won't see them. So they could be there. This article is more about if you have just the right size ones, then they decay at a rate which kind of makes the early universe interesting. Like as they it's decay, it's they're producing particles which smash into other particles and produce radiation. Uh -huh. mm. And so you have a glow. As, so you get this glow, but but so you're adding radiation to the universe at the same time that the universe is expanding and diluting the radiation away, and so you end up with this very nice balance of I'm losing mass, but I'm gaining radiation in such a way that you kind of have this cosmic stasis. Okay, that sounds like the opposite of the Big Bang. Yeah. Like I yeah. thought the whole idea of the Big Bang was it wasn't So here's the thing. State. Mm -hmm. People <laughs> use the term Big Bang for anything very loosely these days. I don't like it. Could use it for oh. like the opening of a new car dealership. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so this doesn't when I use the word Big Bang I'm usually mean the absolute beginning, like right. time equals 0. Right. That's not the way these people are using the, the word Big Bang. And that's not the way that some cosmologists use the word "bang." I don't like it. Okay. I don't wow. like it. So, so what is it doing? It's well, all how would you write this headline? You started I, with a headline that you disapprove of the headline. I disapprove of the headline. Primordial, so ancient. Yep. Black holes that are could be over a range of sizes, including many. Yeah. Did something interesting. Yeah, they changed the, the dynamics of the very early universe. And and does this produce any observable Potentially. signature? Potentially. So it, it might produce a signature, I mean, in a bunch of ways, but the most obvious might be in gravitational waves. So yeah. uh, mm -hmm. there are going to be primordial gravitational waves. This from the, the early universe, as everything's shaking around in the early universe, you produce this background of gravitational waves, which expands with the universe and is still out there. All well, those people pouring into the Taylor Swift concert stadium, the stadium vibrates. The stadium vibrates, and it's still vibrating today, and we can Everything's sense that. Everything's going to be about Taylor Swift. It's all Swift. about Taylor Swift, T-Swift from now on. <laughs> um, and so, unfortunately, the, the gravitational wave observatories that we currently have, LIGO and, and so forth, are not able to detect uh, those kinds of gravitational waves because they're, well, they're kind of, they're old and they're of a longer wavelength since uh -huh. they've spread out because the universe right. has expanded. So you need a big So you need a much, much larger observatory. Space-based. Ooh! And guess what? We're thinking Whoa. about doing that. So that's in the works. It's called LISA, right? The, what is that? Laser... Laser Interferometry, Interferometry space. space Observatory or something like that. It's kind of with an A. Ab oh, LISA. Observatory? It's not LISA. LISA yeah. um, um, from the European Space Agency. Right. And, and that's going to be, you know, LIGO's arms were a couple kilometers long. These arms are going to be a couple million kilometers Does long. Does it help that it's in space? Because, like, there's, yes. a, there's a highway it next helps to and LIGO. Hurts. <laughs> it helps and hurts. It helps and hurts. It's yeah. very hard to do things in space, but, but uh, they... You know, the, the people building Lisa, which, by the way, is not going to launch, you told me, for uh, till the 2030s, right. uh, late 2030s Why? at the earliest. Why? Why would it take so long? It just, it just uh, takes, you know, it you takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. There's still, still, I'm sure there's still some engineering stuff they have yeah. to fig figure out. Mm -hmm. sure. This but would they involve did. three spacecraft, yeah. as you said, very far apart, orbiting the sun in formation, shooting lasers at each other. Right. And they're wow. so far apart that you can't actually shoot it at each other. You have to shoot it at like where the next one's going to be <laughs> when the light gets there because it's like two or three light seconds yeah. separation between the spacecraft. That's amazing. And then inside the spacecraft, they have these like perfect reference masses right. that are just that are floating in, in inside yeah. the spacecraft because the spacecraft is getting pushed around by like solar pressure and other things, and so you have to shield these precious masses inside yeah. from that. Yeah. 
They did it's a proof crazy. of concept That's of this. Insane. They did a proof. They launched back in this is five, eight years ago now or something like that. They launched a proof of concept thing. Yeah. Where they it was in one spacecraft rather than three separate spacecraft, and they were only inches apart rather than. Yeah, but yeah. Hmm. But it worked. <laughs> like yeah. they uh, they wow. were able to have these little masses that are basically in perfect free fall around the sun, uh, and yeah, which, which were, is what you have to have. The separation of them was like less than the size of an atom. Yeah. Uh, the positional oh my God. It's like <laughs> 0.01 nanometers or something like that. A tenth of an angstrom yeah. or something. Uh, yeah, wow. I don't understand. It's bonkers. So it's going to work. And, but, and so <laughs> okay. eventually, if we get Lisa working, when, when we get Lisa when, working, right. it may be able to detect these primordial gravitational and waves. Then, which will be, what will we do? Then we'll say, why, why will we say... Why will we be happy or excited or interested about that? Uh, no, no. Just because Seriously? now we know a little bit more about the early universe. I mean, isn't there some like, okay, there's a model that predicted this may have, I mean, is it going to tell, it's going to tell us how popular Taylor Swift was or something, right? <laughs> I mean, like, see, I'm, I'm actually like no, this just metaphor. Gonna... <laughs> I mean, it's like going to tell us, did these primordial black holes form, which right. has to do with mm -hmm. something about all of that chaos as everybody was pouring into the Taylor Swift concert stadium. Right, right. I mean, the more you know about those first few minutes of the universe, the more you can predict about the later universe and and then figure out how our universe today matches that, and it just tells us how good our models are. Okay, easy for you to say. Yeah. yeah let's see if you can do this one. <laughs> okay, I can't. Oh, no. How many vacuum tubes in ENIAC? A vacuum tube is like a bit, right? So uh, okay. my first computer was the Commodore 64. Oh, I loved the Commodore 64. It has 64,000 bytes. So yeah. whatever, 64 times 8 is 400 and, uh, 512,000 uh, bits. Hmm. How so big are these tubes? They're, 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 size, they're like that. You can pick them up and replace them and stuff. They're individual components. I don't know how big. I don't, you know, they might not have been fist size, but they, they weren't microscopic. No, they might have yeah, been. I don't know. They plug in right. they electrodes. They were evacuated glass tubes. Okay. I'm thinking about it in a more practical way. like How many can you fit in a yeah. giant room? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. Well, that was the limiting factor. That's I why. I feel like. We needed to get the yeah, transistor right. invented. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say like. 5,000. 5,000. I'll say 500. Audrey gets it. Nice. Yes! <laughs> all right. 18,000. 18, right. Pretty good. That's Not good. too that, far off. There are also 7,000 crystal diodes, 1,500 relays, 70,000 resistors, and 10,000 capacitors wow. in ENIAC. When was the first so called monolithic integrated circuit invented? I don't so know. Before your time. The just a kid. 1970. 1963. Jim gets this one. 1960. Okay. Nice. And uh, so Moore's law, if we start doubling in 1960, mm -hmm. right, and you can just may as well start with one. So then you start doubling. So Moore's law doubled every year for the first ten years, and then it's then he's like, no, it's every two years. So based on that, how many? Transistors should be on a chip in 2022 from 1960. So you're, you're asking me to do math. I know, because I don't want <laughs> you to do the math. I just want you to take a, a stab at it together with how many actually are on the a commercial high end integrated circuit computer chip as uh, of last year. That's a good question. I wish I knew even the order. Yeah, I don't know. Five million. Billion. Audrey gets this yeah. one. Nice. Uh, if we did every two years from 1960 to 2022, you'd end up with two billion. Um, if you take that extra fast doubling in the early part, mm -hmm. you can get up to um, uh, 70 billion. Actually, yeah. uh, the Apple M1 Ultra uh, microprocessor, which has got the most of any commercially available microprocessor, has 114 billion. Are you serious? No Transistors. Way. That is mind-boggling. Micron's VNAND chip has 5.3 trillion transistors. What? That's not possible. <laughs> what? What do you do with yeah, that? It's, Wait, it's what, a, why, why how many little tiny people do you have to have to build that? <laughs> I, know, I know. It's crazy. 
Well, while it may have felt like sub light speed interstellar travel, it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Give us five stars and we'll give you the universe. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Walk About the Galaxy, and catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions via the ancient technology of email. That's Ooh. WTG at UCF.edu. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusalem. Production assistance is provided by Logan Basinger. Thanks to our listeners in Perth, Australia, and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Jim Cooney. And I'm Audrey Martin. We're the Astro Cork, signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Swift. Swift? Taylor. <laughs> oh, nice.